Hello, we've got some really exciting news for you today. We're beginning a new partnership with the brilliant photo colorists Dynamochrome. More on that in a bit, but first, welcome to Travels Through Time. I'm Peter Moore. Today we're journeying back to the year 1871 to take an invigorating fresh look at the Scottish explorer and missionary David Livingstone with the award-winning Zimbabwean writer Petina Gapper. On the Zambian side of the Victoria Falls in Southern Africa stands a bronze statue of the Victorian explorer David Livingstone. Livingstone is frozen as he walks. His right hand tilts the brow of his deer stalker upwards so he can get a clearer view of the magnificent sight that lies before him. He's thought to have been the first Briton to have ever clapped eyes on one of the great natural wonders of the world. This is how the story of Livingstone's explorations in Africa is usually framed, through his eyes and through his journals. But what about the people he met on his travels? What did they make of him? This question lies at the heart of an epic new novel by the Zimbabwean writer Patina Gapper. Out of Darkness Shining Light twists perspectives. It tells the story not of Dr Livingston looking out at Africa, but of the African people looking back at him. Patina Gapper is a writer and lawyer with degrees from Cambridge, Graz University and the University of Zimbabwe. Her debut collection of stories, An Elegy for Easterly, won the Guardian First Book Award in 2009. And her first novel, The Book of Memory, was long listed for the 2015 Bailey's Women's Prize for Fiction. I met up with Patina at her publishers the other day. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Welcome to Travels Through Time, Patina. Thank you very much, Peter. I know this goes completely against the grain of what you're trying to do in the novel. But we can we begin this conversation by talking a little bit about David Livingstone? Mm. Because first and foremost, he was a missionary, wasn't he? And I, I suppose he's very different to all the other missionaries of his time. Could you tell us a little bit about him? And, you know, what's, what's your response to David Livingstone? Um, Livingston was, uh, you know, if Livingston had been alive today, one would have said he had a portfolio career mm. because there were many aspects and facets to who he was and what he did. So he started life as a missionary. He wanted to convert Africans to Christianity. In fact, initially he wanted to go to China, but he was unable to go because of the Second Opium War, I think it was. Mm. And so he ended up turning his attention to, to Africa. At the same time, he was a trained medic. He was a doctor. He had trained um, as, as a doctor in his native Scotland. And um, at the end of his life, he was more known as an explorer who had set out to look for the search of the Nile than as a missionary. In fact, you could say he was um, both a failed explorer and a failed missionary. Yeah, it's an interesting way to characterise his <laughs> career. But I suppose as well, he had this enormous energy and willpower, didn't he? And he was always taken by these high-flown schemes, right from, I suppose, his early travels in the 1840s. You know, the idea of a big lake or a distant river always grabbed him. Yes, he wanted to leave his mark. He wanted to be known for achieving great things. So he was the first, I think, to cross Africa from east to west, so from the east coast of Africa, starting from around um, Mozambique, what is now Mozambique, to Angola, right? And of course, he found fame as the first European to see the tremendous Victoria Falls between the Zambian and the Zimbabwean border. And I always say that to his credit, he didn't actually say, I discovered the Victoria Falls. You know, he said, uh, mine are the first European eyes to see this beauty. Mm -hmm. And he named then the falls after his queen while acknowledging in his journal 
that it had other native names. That's quite interesting. So he didn't fall for the discovery narrative that we've been trying to kind of get rid of for so long. Well, look, I mean, I, I, I won't completely absolve him of that because there are other bits where he says, oh, I discovered this and I discovered that. But my recollection of his journal is actually that he says, mine are the first European eyes to see the Mosewe Atunya, as they call it, the smoke that thunders, mm. or Shongwe, the place of the rainbow, I am going to call it the Victoria Falls, after my queen. He also had, as he, I mean, this goes back to the first point I made about him as a missionary. He had this idea that he was ordained by God. He had some predestined ability to solve mysteries, or that he was on a divine quest. Is that right? Yes and no. I mean, he was very much a man of his time. And of course, uh, you know, this is a Victorian England before the ideas of Charles Darwin had been spread quite widely. So this idea that a person can be ordained by God to fulfill a holy mission was still very much in currency. So not only was he a missionary, but you're absolutely right to say that he felt as though that there, there was some holy purpose to what he was doing, especially towards the end of his life, which, which is when he became obsessed with ending the slave trade. Mm. So, in short, I'll try and summarise quite quickly. I think suppose it's the 1850s when he has his great breakthrough and moment of celebrity when he publishes this enormous best-selling book mm. about his early... Missionary travels in Southern Africa, yes. Uh, exactly, yeah. wins the gold medal from the Royal Geographical mm. Society and he becomes... I don't know, just a member of that Victorian cultural elite mm -hmm. for a while. And then in the 1860s, he has maybe not so much success. And uh, this is a period of his life that you satirise a little bit in the novel when he's trying to, you know, kind of go upstream. Yes, he's trying to go up the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Yes, so. but even that, that expedition was quite successful as well, in a sense, because it cemented him further in the Victorian imagination as this really heroic figure mm. who was going out to explore parts unknown. And his second book then, the narrative of uh, an expedition to the Zambezi and his tributaries, was also quite successful. So that actually by 1866, he was able, you know, through fundraising and through sales of his books, to fund his own, his own expedition, his last journey, where he was actually unencumbered by traveling with people from the Royal Geographic Society and, uh, and other missionaries and so on. So he went on a solo trip, which ended up as his last journey. And we're going to get onto that shortly. But of course, and this is the central point that we have to make, he didn't operate in isolation. We're trying mm. to get away from this like kind of great hero narrative. Mm. Um, he was supported by, relied upon networks of these heroic compatriots. Exactly. You know, comrades. it's like that, that trivial pursuit question. Who, know, who was the first man to ascend the, the summit of Everest? Mm. And, you know, the early answers would be Sir Edmund Hillary. And Tenzing would never be mentioned, you know, would never be mentioned as the Sherpa who, who got him there. But that's exactly what expedition like life was like in pre-colonial Africa. You needed to traverse huge distances. Mm. And to do that successfully, you needed to have the assistance mm. of uh, porters. You know, in, in the Swahili, they call them the pagazi. You know, you are porters. And also sometimes soldiers who are mm. called askari. You know, mm -hmm. because sometimes there were battles to be fought, you know, hostile groups to be overcome. And there was a lot of work involved in expedition life. So uh, many of these explorers will travel with up to, um, I think Stanley traveled with about 100 people. Yeah, and they were enormous logistical enterprises, weren't Absolutely. they? I mean, right at the start of your book, you've got this map of Africa with like the little, like kind of broken dotted line which shows where you know these expeditions went to. Mm. And if these were like trail maps around a local park, you'd think they were quite big. But these are going across a continent, going across course. an entire continent, going across an, an yeah. and so that's like really striking. I, I love the the way you do twist this focus. You have a wonderful description of him as a wandering Muzungu. Yes, yes. Uh, in fact, is... the word Muzungu is, is Swahili for white person, and apparently the etymology of that is that people on the, on the East African coast used to see these white people just coming to wander around for no good reason. So it comes from Kuzunguzuka, or in Shona we call it Kuzungaira, which is to, to go around with no proper reason. You know, so that's where Muzungu apparently comes from. Oh, really? <laughs> I love that. That's... I don't actually know whether that's really the true etymology, but I just love that... Um, anecdotal story exactly well it's interesting etymology but it also 
is at the heart of the idea of the book, which is twisting the focus. Absolutely. Not looking out at Victoria Falls from, you know, Livingstone's eyes. From the white gaze. No, absolutely. And and, and for me, because this is a work of historical fiction, it was important for me to not infuse my characters with views that are too modern, because they would have seemed very anachronistic at the time. So to me, it seemed perfectly, you know, it, it seemed to make a lot of sense to have Livingston viewed by at least his uh, uneducated, illiterate cook Halima as this crazy, nutty person. I loved Halima's who's voice. Left, <laughs> who's left the comfort of his home to look for the beginning of a river. Yeah. Why on earth would anyone do that? And then on the other hand, you have Jacob Wainwright, the second narrator, mm. who judges him uh, according to a very strict standard mm. because Jacob was a, a slave. He is a freed slave who believes that it was Christianity that saved him. And so he wants to Christianize his continent. And he thinks that David Livingston hasn't done nearly enough to achieve that. Mm. But it's this idea, I suppose, of all these encounters. And you've got Livingston almost as a a character who generates drama by his presence because people look at him, they wonder what he's doing, what's his motive. And from that, you get that sense of tension, which is always really interesting to write about. There was a moment in the book that I loved where you uh, talk about him just washing his hair in the river. Yes, And yes. everyone's saying that he's taking his brains out and <laughs> exactly. putting his brains back in. And, and people uh, wondering what the white man's like on the inside. Is he, <laughs> is he white all the way through or does he change colour in I, the middle? Or? I had the most tremendous uh, fortune to write about a man, and obviously uh, the, the focus on his companions, but to, to as my source material, uh, Livingstone's journals were so rich because he was such a gossip, you know, and, and he, 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 he had this wonderful eye for detail, you know. So he, he's actually the, the person who narrates uh, what happens when he gets into a river to, to bathe himself and that everybody gathers around because they're seeing the soap suds on his head and thinking that they are his brains, you know. This is pure theatre. For a novelist, this Isn't must be it exciting. Just, yeah, it's very filmic. Yeah. I'm hoping somebody buys well, the film rights. <laughs> Listen out. Okay, well, we're going to go and look at um, the year 1871, is that right? That's this, right, This is yes. towards the end of Livingston's life. Yes. He's an old explorer rambling around on the lookout for the source of the Nile. That's what's driving him. And do you want to just characterise 1871? I mean, you can do it broadly, or you can do it in specific to Livingston. Okay, so um, 1871 was a really interesting year. Um, in fact, I would say sort of between 1870 to 1875, a lot of the things that we now associate with modernity were happening around the world at that time. Uh, the Suez Canal had just been opened in 1869. Three years later, and this is one of my favorite details, in 1873, in May 1873, the month of Livingstone's death actually, Levi Strauss got the patent to strengthen the pockets of his denim jeans. And that's how the, you know, the, the Levi Strauss company began. They started manufacturing denim jeans that very month, May 1873. We had characters like Ma Barker, this crime matriarch uh, in Chicago, going to, who eventually went toe-to-toe with the FBI you know, in a very famous shootout. So there's a lot that was happening in that five-year period between sort of 1870 and 1875 that has ripple effects today. Again, in October, I think it was 1873, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police were, were enacted. The Mounties. The Mounties by oh, right. Canadian Parliament. So it's such a rich period because it, it's almost like we're on the verge of modernity, you know, mm-hmm. and a lot of the things that were happening still have a, have a, a felt today and have an impact today. But I've chosen 1871 because I wanted to talk about a time in the history of Africa that proved to be absolutely momentous for the continent. Wow. Livingston was born in 1813, so he's, eight, so he's 58 by this 1813, point. 1813, yes. Yeah. And this is like in 19th century terms, you know, towards the end. They used to talk, if you get to 60, that was not yeah, bad. Yeah, the three score. <laughs> the three score, exactly. Yeah. So Dickens, for example, yeah. I think didn't last much longer than no. 58. It's, that's the kind of span, I think. Mm. So you can imagine it's a very hard life as well mm. that he's lived... Where would you like to go for your first scene? I would like to take us to the 21st of March in 1871. We are on the east coast of what is of Africa in a port that is now called the city of Bagamoyo and about to set off into what he calls darkest Africa into the interior is the American journalist Henry Morton Stanley. 
Well, there's a bit to unpack here. First of all, let's do a bit of geography so people can get this straight. You say this is modern-day Tanzania. Yes. It, would it be to the south of Dar es Salaam and It's Zanzibar? just to the south of Dar es Salaam and across from Zanzibar. So right in the middle of that kind of really thriving trade yes. area of the East African. So this would be obviously a, a quite a sensible place to land and to begin a an expedition, maybe. Yes, it's, it's, it's a wonderful place to land and begin an expedition because there were already settlements, you know, some German settlements and things like that. Um, this is before the colonization of Africa, but there was already some thriving activity between Europe and Africa centering around uh, the port of Bagamoyo. Yeah, okay. So tell us a bit about this character that we're going to go and have a look at. Who is he? So Henry Morton Stanley, HMS, as I call him, he's, he's got the most incredible story. He was a total fraud. You know, he invented a family that he didn't have, a name that he didn't have. And it turned out that he was actually a Welsh orphan who somehow ended up in the U.S., where he fought on both sides of the American Civil War. Was he, did he have a great moral change of heart, or was it just uh, experience? Oh, no, he was, I think he was the ultimate opportunist, you know. <laughs> so then he becomes a journalist in New York, and he works for this campaign. Good job for paper. an opportunist, a journalist. A very good job for, for an opportunist. He worked for this campaigning uh, newspaper called the New York Herald. Um, and under the leadership of James Gordon Bennett, um, they do all sorts of interesting things. So Stanley decides that he is going to go into Africa to look for Livingstone, who at this point had been lost for six years. Yeah, because he no started had... this last journey, as we now call it today. Probably that's what <laughs> he wasn't calling it that at the time. I <laughs> he was just calling it a journey. <laughs> yeah, just, just another I'll journey. I'll be back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, so this, he'd started that in what, in the late... Or 66. 1866, yes. Yeah, so we're now five years on from that. So disappeared off looking for the Nile. You're sending a an upstart journalist to go and track him down. An upstart journalist who's never really travelled on African soil, knows nothing about expedition life. One of my favourite details is that he carried a tin bath with him. You know, just for that nice soak in the jungle, you know. Mm. Um, And he, he had a lot of luxury things that he carried champagne with him, you know. Very much like, you know, Captain Scott going to the Antarctic with all this heavy silver. So we shouldn't imagine him (laughs) arriving on his own. He was quite well appointed. Uh, This is maybe journalistic budgets were a bit higher in this era. Well, he had quite a bit of money, uh, obviously from the newspaper, because it was going to be the scoop of the year if they had managed to find Livingston, you know. And so he had about a hundred porters. That's a lot of men for, for an expedition like this. And in fact, we're going to see later on that when, when he does see Livingston, Livingston says, this is a luxurious traveller, very different from me. Can we imagine, yeah. I remember the very first of these time travels we did was with Michael Palin, and mm. he was going off um, in search of John Franklin and that famous expedition they had up to the Arctic, and he never came back, of course. But I suppose it was probably a bit of a thing in the 19th century for these explorers to disappear off and then they'd either reappear or or they wouldn't as oh, circumstance would have it so that's a, maybe a bit of context no exactly because uh, there were all these rumors that were reaching england about about uh, livingston's fate you know people were saying he's been murdered in africa he's been eaten and in fact one of the poems that we did at school um at my primary school one of the lines was oh where is dr livingston dr david livingston we'd better send mr stanley to see if he's been eaten. <laughs> that was uh, a child. Oh, yeah. Children's I was uh, one of the first black children to integrate a formerly all white school in Rhodesia. Wow. So that was the kind of um, poetry that we did. So, anyway, so there are all these rumors about Livingston, and Stanley, the intrepid journalist, decides I am going to be the one to solve this riddle. So, to catch up at this moment would be to catch um, someone on an unlikely enterprise chasing someone on an unlikely enterprise. So right, a, a that's nice a very good of, way of putting it. <laughs> there's a nice sense of symmetry there. Do we have a, like, a visual kind yeah. of picture of Stanley? What did he look yeah. like? And, and basically, he's looking not just for, for Livingston. He's um, well, it's sort of a portly man, you know, yeah. with uh, sort of, I, in, in the book I call them boiled groundnut eyes, you yeah. know, because it's got very light coloured eyes. I think that's the cook speaking, isn't it? <laughs> yes, exactly, because she, she's never really seen sort of like greyish, bluish eyes before. But he's not just looking for, and this is really important to understand the character of Stanley, he's not just looking for Livingston. He's looking for a story, and in fact, he writes to his editor, wherever he is, be sure I shall not give up the chase. If alive, you shall hear what he has to say. If dead, I will find him and bring his bones to you. 
Oh god, that's a chilling, yeah. maybe a bit of foreshadowing and, there. As and well. this this is actually quite quite uh, it's, it's it's kind of like foreshadowing Stanley's work later on for the king uh, King Leopold in 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 colonizing the Congo mm. because Stanley of course eventually became Leopold's chief agent in uh, turning the whole of the Congo into the personal property of the king of Belgium mm. a very brutal colony that that was yeah you said right at the beginning of your description of this scene that he's I don't know how quite how you described him but it was in almost in a like a lovable rogue is he the kind of person you'd like to meet or would you like to keep your distance from Stanley? You know, I'm actually very grateful that it was Livingstone whose body was carried out by his companions and not Stanley because I don't think I would have managed to write well about Stanley because I, I don't warm to him mm. in the same way that I warmed to Livingstone, for instance. I mean, Livingstone was a deeply flawed man. He made many mistakes. He had some very patronizing and pre-colonialist views of Africans in some instances. But there's something about him that is very appealing and that is very likable. And I think that is also the key to what his companions then did eventually to carrying his body. Where is Stanley? Halima, my cook, describes him as, ooh, I don't think I'd want to lie down with that one. You know, there's something of, of the cold fish about him. There's something that's not quite human. You know, there isn't a warmth to... Mm. Everything is calculated. I suppose as well what this scene does, it tells us about Stanley, of course, because he's the central character that we're looking at. Mm. It also tells us about Livingstone as, as well, because if he's worth going to chase on such an unlikely errand as this, he, he must be he, quite he's a celebrity. worth a story. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Hello, I'm Peter Moore. You should be familiar with my voice by now, as I've been presenting Travels Through Time over the past year. This week, we're having a brief interlude in our conversation with Patina Gapper to bring you some really exciting news for the podcast. Today, we're starting a new partnership with the photo colorists at Dynamic Room. Now, you probably know a little bit about photo colorization already. It involves the clever use of new digital technologies to bring old black and white photographs back to vivid, captivating life in HD color. Well, Jordan Lloyd of Dynamic Room is one of the world's absolute best at doing this. He's created brilliant artwork for the Manic Street Preachers, he's been commissioned by the Times of London, and his work's been on the front cover of National Geographic magazine. You've maybe already seen some of his work without even knowing it. Portraits of President Abraham Lincoln or Marilyn Monroe, or great sweeping vistas of the D-Day beaches. He's doing pretty much what we're trying to do at Travels Through Time, which is to make the past as vivid as the present. We're incredibly proud to be partnering with him. We'll be telling you more about Dynamic Room's brilliant work over the weeks ahead. But if you're curious now and want to see what I mean, please do head to tttpodcast.com forward slash Dynamic Room to find out more. Thank you. Let's go on from that. Let's progress. Let's go right. to your second so, scene. Now, so Stanley is setting off from Bagamoyo. He's going to the African interior with these 100 porters who include Jacob Wainwright, one of my narrators. Yeah. And it's a group of freed slaves and free men who are working uh, for Stanley in this huge enterprise to find Livingston. And meanwhile, where is Livingston? Mm. Is this right. where you're going to take us to for your second yes, scene? Yes, this is now my second scene. So I'm going to take us to, uh, to my second scene which is in Nyangwe, which is a, a, a village uh, with a thriving market in a province called Manyema on the right bank of the Lualaba River in what is now the Democratic Republic of Congo. Mm. So you see how quickly we're moving across vast uh, Africa's vast territories. So now if Stanley is setting off from Bagamoyo, he's somewhere still negotiating his way across Tanzania. Yeah. And now we are in what is now the Congo, in this place called Nyangwe where Livingston is not dead, he hasn't been eaten, he's very much alive. So what is the thing that takes you to this place at this time? Well, Livingston is now very desperate for food, for supplies, and is not making a lot of progress because he doesn't have anything to trade with. So he's sort of like moving slowly down the south because he is looking for the source of the Nile. Mm -hmm. And he has this edifix in his mind that Herodotus you know, whom at that time was considered the father of history, but now we really just call him the father of lies, right? He is convinced that Herodotus has the answer. 
And this is the mountains of the moon, the old idea. Exactly. Somewhere in, you know, before we had... Yeah, the mountains of the moon, the Queen yeah. of Sheba, you know, yeah. all, all that stuff. So he believes that uh, Herodotus has the answer in that he had written about these four fountains bursting out of the earth, right? Two going up and two flowing south, right? And he believes that these fountains are the source of the Nile. And he thinks that there's a link, a geographical link, between the rivers that he already knows, the Kafue, the Zambezi, the Lomame, and the Nile. So now he's following the southward flow of, I think it's the Lomame, to try and see where it connects with the Zambezi and others, right? And he believes that once he finds this great fountains, you know, these four great fountains, he will have solved the, the secret. Mm. But of course, he's going the wrong way. He's going the wrong way because he should have gone east and north and east, because the source of the Nile, of course, is up in near Ethiopia, Uganda, that area, right? So he's going down to what is now Zambia. And at the present moment, we find him in the area that is now the Democratic Republic of Congo, or the former Zaire. And something happens on this day, doesn't Something it? terrible happens to, to him on the 15th of July, which is that he is in the marketplace with some of his men looking for food. They're trading, they're trading the few beads and things that they have, to get a chicken here, you know, some, some fruit there. And then there is a sound of gunfire. And about four men just start shooting at everybody in this market. And there are loud screams of women, because it's mainly a women's market, women being shot, being killed, children being shot, men being shot. And because Nyangwe is on the banks of the river, some of the people trying to escape the shooting are jumping into the river, but they're now actually swimming against the current and many of them drown. It became known as the massacre of the Manyema women. Yeah, it is a massacre, isn't it? And I think this is what we have to underscore because the number of people that died, I think you put it around 400 in in the book. So Conservative, 400, yeah. Yeah, and of course these numbers could be quite different. It could have been greater, yes. And the people who were doing the firing, why did they fire? So Livingston writes that he, he didn't ever manage to get to the roots of uh, what the initial issue was, but it was a man called Dugumbe who was a feared slave trader. And I suspect that it was one of those acts that were meant to subdue the local population because perhaps they were not supplying him with enough slaves to take to the coast. And as a shore of force and a shore of power, he decided that he was going to teach these people a lesson. I think that might be one of the reasons that this happened. But it's actually a very mysterious incident because Livingston didn't quite write the truth. Mm, about and we only it. have a partial account. We have a partial account, and not only a partial account, but they've done some scientific testing on the paper that he wrote on. Because remember, at this time, he had no supplies. So he was writing over old newspaper old newspapers, London Illustrated Times and so on, and using berry juice mm. to write. So they've, they've done some, I can't report the process is Yeah, this was reported a few years ago, wasn't yes. it? When they did some quite clever forensic work Exactly, on the to sort of like see what lay underneath it. And uh, it turns out that when he then transcribed the story in his journal, when Stanley brought him new paper and so on, he had left out some key details, such as the suspicion that some of his men may have been involved, and also some details about his own relationship to this Dugumbe, the slave trader. Exactly, and it's immediately apparent to me why you'd want to go back to this scene, because it it not only, I suppose, there's that element of uncertainty about what happened, because, you know, to be there would be to see, but to have this Livingston figure in the middle of it would be adding an extra dimension to. Would you characterise this extremely unusual event? I think it was extremely unusual in, in the sense that there was an eyewitness yeah. who wrote about it. Yeah. But this is, I believe, just one of the cruel aspects of the East African slave trade and, of course, the West African slave trade. But we don't really read that much about the East African slave trade. We read a lot more about... The Atlantic. the Atlantic slave trade, because of course a lot of the descendants of the slaves are writing these powerful stories and narratives and doing all this this research. Whereas with the East African slave, it was an internal slave trade. Yeah. So you go to a place like Zanzibar, for instance, where I spent a month and a half writing, and you find that the descendants of slave owners and the descendants of slaves are living side by side. 
So it's it was mainly an internal slave trade up and down the East African coast, and occasionally Oman and Arab countries would be involved, and India. And it'd be connected to India as and well. It'd be connected to India, but it was mainly sort of like slaves being moved up and down the coast and so, into Zanzibar. And, and these um, these slave trading processes, they would always work in little routes, wouldn't they? Yes. And what we're going into now is one of the interior routes of exactly. the slave trade, which is quite poorly documented. Yes, exactly, because uh, th- th- there doesn't seem to be much that is written about that, you know, that the interior move of slaves. And what was really quite uh, sad to, to, to understand for me when I was doing the research was why the name Bagamoyo exists. Remember, Bagamoyo is the port from which Sandy has set forth to go into the, into the coast. So what would happen is that slaves would be taken from the interior of the Africa and marched to the coast, to Bagamoyo, and then transported across the water to Zanzibar. And Bagamoyo became famous as that the last place that slaves would see the, the shore of Africa before going to the island. And Bagamoyo in Swahili means to lay down your heart mm. or to lay down the burden of your heart. But it also has another meaning. Baga is an onomatopoeic sound that means to crack and Moyo is heart. So it's also the place of cracking or breaking hearts. Yeah, you've got a beautiful passage in the book where you kind of meld this massacre with that description and apply it to Livingston in a way. And you say yes. this is the place where you think his heart cracked. Yes, because, I mean, it was a dreadful thing because what then happened is that uh, he and his men helped to bury the bodies. And, in fact, they had tried to rescue some of the women who had fallen into the water but in a state of panic, some of the women didn't understand who was a friend and who was a foe, so lashed out and hit out and ended up drowning. So he felt incredibly helpless mm. watching these people die in front of him without being able to do anything about it. So Halima, in her narration, believes that that was the beginning of the end for Livingston. Yeah, because she likens it to this moment, as you say, with the slaves when it's almost like a loss of will. Yes. And it's that thing, and we see it sometimes with people we know when, you know, they just lose that, like, desire. Remember that Samuel Johnson thing he said, the point of life is to go forward. Mm. But sometimes if that will leaves you, Mm. and this is how you describe the slaves, they would just sometimes fall down. Yeah, and it's a a very common pattern uh, if you have any loved ones who've been in long marriages, you know, people married for 50, 60 years, one partner dies and then the other one almost immediately follows. Yeah. There's that something that, that just breaks in you and you, you sort of, as you say, you kind of like lose the will to live. And, and I think that's, um, so something like that happened to Livingston, or at least in Halima's understanding of, you know, limited understanding of psychology, something like that happened to Livingston when he saw the, the massacre. And while I'm on this point, let me just say that one of the only forms of protest that slaves had when they were being marched to the coast was to refuse to walk because no one could carry them, you know. And remember, these slaves are also carrying things with them, so elephant tasks or whatever. So you're not only cargo, but you're also carrying cargo. So one of the most effective forms of protest was to simply refuse to walk. But the way the slave traders dealt with that was to tie the refusers to the tree and leave them to die. So throughout the journey that these companions make, they sometimes see little piles of bones under trees. And these are the remains of slaves who would have been tied to trees for refusing to walk. And this is such a lost history, isn't it? It's so difficult to find, because these are undocumented acts for the most time. Yes, who's especially, going to, yeah, who's especially going to the East history. African slave trade. And, and that's why it took me such a long time to research it, because there was just so much detail. Um, so not only did I try to understand expedition life, you know, what time people got up in the morning, what they ate, how they moved, what kind of distances they traveled. But I was also trying to understand how the East African slave trade operated, you know. And this massacre of the Manyema women really was a a central moment in Livingston's life because, in a way, um, his eyewitness account is what ended up closing the Zanzibar market. So that was Livingston's posthumous success, in a sense. 
And you did give us a glimpse as well through the story of Jacob Wainwright, who's one of the um, characters in the novel. Is he going to appear in our scenes? He might. Mm, well, he's with Stanley at the moment. He's, he's a, as we're talking. He's with Stanley. As we're they're having, marching down somewhere. They're yeah. marching around somewhere. But he's um, he becomes a really important character in the book, and indeed one of your narrators. But mm. he is one of these who was enslaved and escaped on the way to Zanzibar. So you did give us a bit of an insight into that process. Well, that was one of the absolutely most incredible things that I discovered as I was writing this book, which is that Britain had, of course, abolished the slave trade in 1807, and then slavery itself in 1833. But the trade was still continuing. Slavery was still very much an institution on both sides of the African coast. So the British Navy would run blockades to rescue captured slaves and to stop slaves from reaching the Americas, the Caribbean, and then on the East African coast from reaching Oman, India, and from going up and down the coast. And one of the ships that was involved in, in, in these blockades was called the HMS Daphne. And there's a wonderful account by the captain of the HMS Daphne about you know his operations on the East African coast. And so I imagined him rescuing a party of slaves uh, who had been captured, then of course the question is, what do they do when they capture the slaves? They don't know where home is. Some will have come from the middle of Africa, the GRC. Some will have come from Malawi or wherever. So what the British did was to establish a school in India that was called the Nasik School in the Principality of Bombay, where the captured slaves, especially the young boys, would be educated, taught to speak English, Christianized, given Christian names, and taught a trade, a cartography or carpentry or shipbuilding. And then when the explorers were refueling in India and going into Africa, they would ca- take some of the, these boys with them. So in that sense, you get this, um, this sense of lives being played out across geographies and yes. changing at moments of capture and freedom but then is it freedom at all if you're being then you know your your body might be released but your mind's being taken by absolutely so that's why jacob wainwright judges livingston by such a harsh standard Mm. as being one who has failed to christianize the continent and thus Mm. end the slave trade because to him being a christian is what saved him from what he calls the darkness and bondage of slavery so he's very, he's very harsh on himself, on Livingston, on other people as well. But I thought that this was actually appropriate to a person of his time, you know, because this is before, this is even before the colonial era. So we're not even talking about the decolonization process because it hasn't even happened yet. You know, so this idea that a religion can capture a soul and a mind and lead to a kind of self-loathing, I think it's, uh, it's very appropriate for somebody of his time. All of these ideas are embedded in that second scene. There's, mm. the, there's the horrific violence, but there's that sense of people being owned. And at the same time, you have Livingston in the centre of it having a hugely emotional experience. Mm. Let's move on to your third scene, please. Right, so our third and final scene takes us to Ujiji, right? Those who know the story of Livingston and Stanley will know that Ujiji is the town where they finally met. So we are now sort of uh, in November, October of 1871, and Stanley finally gets to Ujiji, which is in uh, present-day Tanzania, and he finally meets Livingston. And I'm going to ask you, Peter, what does he say when he sees Livingston? Well, there's this really famous... <laughs> you're going to tell me that it's not true. It never happened. Isn't it, isn't it Mr... You're Mr Livingston, I Dr. presume. Dr Livingston, I presume. Yeah, it's a, well, this is a bit too he, theatrical to be... He, he doffs his cap. No, he actually puts on his finest attire. When, once he hears that there's a white man in the village, there's someone, he puts on his finest attire. He flies the American flag. He has his hundred porters with his tin bath and his champagne and all the rest of it coming to you know to this village in this splendid group and he sees an old frail white man emerging from a hut he takes off his cap doffs and says dr livingston i presume except it didn't happen like that (laughs) (laughs) this is this is 
just tell you the journalist, you know. So did he make up this history later on? Is this a subsequent invention? Or well, do we just not know? Do you know, I, I, I won't go as far as saying that he made it up. But I will say that the circumstantial evidence is that he might have. Because the journal pages that actually describe his, his uh, meeting with Livingston are somehow mysteriously missing from his, from his original journals. I think it's one of those moments, you know, when you, you're having a, you know, maybe a tiff on Twitter or, or Facebook with somebody, and then you are, you're sort of like caught up in the moment and you don't really know what to say. And then afterwards you say, ah, oh, this is what I should have said. You know, so I think it was one of those things for Stanley that this is something that he only invented after the meeting. Mm. Because... Livingston himself doesn't talk about the Dr. Livingston, I presume. He, he has a very so, somber sort of account of how they, how they met. The first thing he, he said when he saw Stanley was, this must be a luxurious traveler. And then he discovers it's the American Mr. Stanley sent by James Gordon Bennett to relieve him, write his story. So that, has, that is how Livingston <laughs> met Stanley. Then... One morning, after Buanada Woody had finally decided to strike for Unyanyembe, Emisozi had said she would come with us. We could scarcely believe it when Susi came running at top speed to where we were all gathered at the morning meal in Gust Out. An Englishman, I see him. He rushed back again before we could make sense of his words. Within a short time, he was back, leading a large party. And what a party it was. Behind Susi came a short Muzungu man with so much hair about his face you could barely see his skin. I could not stop looking at his eyes. Unlike Buana Dawoodis, they had no color in them and put one in mind of a ghost. And though the thought was frightening, it was hard to look away. Behind him came Pagazi after Pagazi and more than 20 Askari carrying shining guns and muskets with not a single bit of rust on them. This is a wealthy traveller, said Buanag Daudi. Oh, the things he had with him. Piles and piles of goods, bales and bales of cloth, endless strings of beads and I don't know what, along with two bats of tin, huge kettles, cooking pots and tins. He walked up to Buanag Daudi and shook his hand and said a greeting. By this time, Olof Ujiji had come to witness this meeting. Susi translated his words for us all and said he was a Muzungu called Buana Stanley who had come all this way to find his friend. Susi told us that he said to Buana Dawoodi, It can only be that you are Buana Dawoodi. <laughs> well, if that is not the most stupid thing I have ever heard, I said to Susi, of course it could only be Buana Dawoodi. He was the only Muzungu among a great crowd of people who were not Wazungu, wasn't he? So who else could he possibly have been if not himself? Wana Dawoodi greeted him warmly and truly he rejoiced like a chicken that had been spared the pot that he did, though it was a quiet sort of rejoicing as was usual with him. He kept calling Wana Stanley an Americano, which I had thought to be a type of cloth, but what he meant was that the flag of Wana Stanley was from America, just like the Americano cloth is from the same place. Very good cloth it is too, if a little stiff. Buana Stanley had strange things with him, like champagne, a sort of water that sparkled and bubbled as he and Buana Dawoodi drank it out of great silver goblets. Fajali Christi, who was Buana Stanley's cook, kept some aside for me to try. It bubbled up my nose and made me sneeze. It was then that he told me it was a honguru and I had taken an intoxicating drink, the filthy goat. Best not to tell Amoda, I said, and drank it up. Extract from the moment that Stanley and Livingstone met in 1871 from Petina Gapa's Out of Darkness, Shining Light, read by Makumborero Kasipu. You brought it all together for us at the end. There's much more we can go into that. But I just say in the novel, you write sparklingly about this kind of coming together. And there's some wonderful champagne drinking as viewed through the eyes of the cook, <laughs> which I really love. And she gets her hand on a bit of champagne as yes. well. And there's a lot of merriment. But really, it's, it's a little, like, little narrative arc which shows us a little bit of Livingston mm. towards the end of his life. Mm. Caught with the dilemmas but glimpsing things nonetheless. Well, what I love about those last two scenes is that we see Livingston at one of the lowest points of his life. 
And then just a few months later, he actually talks about the Good Samaritan who rescues him. We see Livingston at the high point because now he has supplies. He can tell his story to the world. Uh, Stanley promises that he's going to send more men. And um, now he believes he can really continue his journey to find the source of the Nile. So in a sense, after the heartbreak and the cracking of the heart at Nyangwe, by the time we get to Ujiji, Livingston is reborn. Wow. One last question to you before I free you to travel on your own adventures through 2020. <laughs> if you could bring one tangible memento back from this year, from that time, is there anything you'd like to have? Maybe something in your writing office or on your writing desk? Do you know what I would like to have? I would like to have the instruments that David Livingston used and that were purloined by Lieutenant Cameron <laughs> when he met the traveling party carrying his body and they just basically took all the instruments and they've never been seen again. Wow. Yeah, that's what I would like to have. Wow. <laughs> They'd be something to have a look at. <laughs> Patina Gaffer, it's been oh, an thank absolute you so much, pleasure. Peter. It's thank a wonderful so book. Congratulations. That was me, Peter Moore, talking to Patina Gaffer the other day. A few words I thought might be quite useful just to take Livingstone's story through to its end. 18 months after his meeting with Henry Stanley, by April 1873, he was mortally ill, he was bleeding profusely, and he was being carried on a litter. He died eventually during the night of the 30th of April 1873 at the village of Chitambo. His heart and his viscera were buried on the spot, but his companions decided to carry Livingston's embalmed body back to the coast. They eventually reached Bagamoyo in February of 1874, and on the 18th of April 1874, Livingston was buried in the nave of Westminster Abbey. This really is the arc of the story that Patina Gappa retells in Out of Darkness, Shining Light. The novel is really, really worth exploring. It's a fresh perspective. It's available now from Faber in the UK and from Scribner in the USA. Huge thanks to Mako Casipo for giving us a reading in there too. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks for listening to this episode of Travels Through Time. To check out the full library of our tours into the past, please visit our website at tttpodcast.com. With the final instalment of Hilary Mantel's Thomas Cromwell trilogy, The Mirror and the Light, due for release on Thursday, what better time to listen to our live episode on Cromwell with Professor Damod McCulloch, it begins, like the novel, with Anne Boleyn's execution in May 1536. You can keep up with us on Twitter at, at tttpodcast underscore, where we'll be sharing more of our old episodes and some amazing historical imagery from our partner, Dynamochrome. We'll be back next Tuesday with a thrilling spy story from Owen Matthews. Till then, goodbye. <laughs>